senior fellow and president emeritus at the Technology uh, Policy Institute, and uh, um, welcome to this to this uh, panel on the Facebook uh, Cambridge uh, Analytica controversy and what the what the regulatory and policy implications of it are. I actually had been thinking that you know there wasn't that much going on in the world of privacy, and then but and then this happened. So so. There is enough to keep our interest. I think probably as most everybody in this room knows uh, the outlines of the uh, Facebook Cambridge Analytica story are, are uh, by now pretty familiar. A Cambridge University researcher developed an app for a quiz taken by 270,000 people and the app gathered data not only on the 270,000 people but also uh, on uh, as many as 87 million of their Facebook friends. And these data were provided to Cambridge Analytica, which is a political consulting firm that worked for the Trump campaign. Facebook claims the data gathering practices uh, used by Cambridge Analytica violated uh, its data sharing policies and they requested that the data be deleted, which apparently uh, did not happen. Uh, as you know, the markets uh, reacted uh, swiftly and severely in the span of a week. Facebook shareholders saw their equity value decline by 14%, about a $75 billion hit. Uh, and the market decline spread uh, to all the FANG stocks, <coughs> although Facebook fell, uh, fell the most. And all of this led to uh, about 10 hours of uh, congressional testimony by Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg um, surely the most wa the most watched uh, technology related hearing uh, probably since Bill Gates testified 20 years ago um, we have a great panel to uh, uh, to discuss this issue I'll, I will introduce them briefly and uh, uh, and uh, their their more detailed bios are you are available in a handout uh, but they all are very, very qualified and very experienced uh, in this field. Uh, Howard Beals is a professor of strategic management and public policy at uh, George Washington. He's published numerous articles on a whole range of consumer pr uh, protection issues, privacy issues, advertising issues, uh, and he served uh, from 2001 to 2004 as director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the FTC. Stu Ingus is a nationally recognized uh, attorney and thought leader on privacy, marketing, advertising, e-commerce, and internet law. He is the chairman of Venable LLP and co-leader co of their e-commerce privacy and cy cybersecurity group, uh, and which won, and that group won the Chambers USA Award for Excellence for the top privacy practice and top advertising practice in the United States. Adam Thier is a senior research fellow uh, with the Technology Policy Program at uh, the Mercatus Center at George, at George Mason, he, uh, and he has written widely on a whole range of technology, media, uh, internet, and free speech uh, issues um, with particular focus on online safety and digital privacy. He has uh, been at a, a number of think tanks before his present position, the Cato Institute, Heritage Foundation, Progress and Freedom Foundation, where we were colleagues, um, before going to Mercatus. And last but not least, Josephine Wolf is an assistant professor in the Public Policy Department at the Rochester Institute of Technology. She's also a member of the extended faculty of the Computing Security Department. She's a faculty associate of the Harvard Berkman Center for Internet and Society and a fellow uh, at the New America uh, Cybersecurity uh, Initiative. So what I thought I would do is, I'm hoping to keep this pretty, uh, pretty conversational and informal, but I thought I would start out and ask each of the panelists to talk for a few minutes um, on what they think uh, are the most important issues uh, that are raised. Uh, by the Cambridge Analytica uh, episode. You want to start us off? We'll just go down the road. All right. Well, thanks, thanks, Tom. Um, let me highlight what I think are three important points here. Uh, first, what's at issue here is not sensitive data. 
uh, this is data that was collected by probably most Facebook apps for a period of about five years uh, in accordance with Facebook's year, uh, with with Facebook's rules. Um, uh, nothing bad has happened to anybody uh, because of the availability of that information. Uh, this is uh, a breach without uh, uh, any significant adverse consequences to the information whose people was shared. Um, uh, and, and, and I think that is um, an essential point to, to, to keep this in perspective. This, this is not information that's harmful to consumers. Uh, it is information that is uh, about consumers and has been widely used uh, in a variety of contexts. And this isn't the first time it's been used in a political context. Uh, the Obama administration or the Obama campaign boasted about having used exactly this tool and exactly this data to build a database of every American voter. So 87 million people is is um, of, of, is pretty minor uh, uh, use of the data. Um, second, as, as Tom mentioned, this is information that was um, shared in violation of Facebook's policies for people who acquire information through apps. Um, because the developer who wrote the app and ga gathered the data uh, gave or sold it to Cambridge Analytica. Uh, the real issue here is how much we want Facebook or anybody else to police um, uh, uh, app developers uh, who write an app to run on a platform. Uh, and it's essentially the same issue uh, as, uh, as the extent to which we want them to police content. Um, like um, um, like terrorist beheadings or live suicides, uh, or uh, bad conduct, uh, like Russian interference through trolls or um, terrorist communications or criminal activity that happens on the platform. Uh, perfect control isn't possible um, uh, in in any uh, in any reasonable um, uh, uh, state of the world that you might imagine. Uh, but certainly to me, asking Facebook or anybody else to worry about these privacy issues more than um, potential terrorists uh, seems to me to be the wrong set of priorities. Um, third, I think the whole way we think about uh, privacy that of notice and choice uh, uh, is, is really sort of an illusion of control. Uh, nobody reads privacy policies in any detail. Nobody should. Uh, the, there's an interesting study that said the opportunity cost of reading online privacy policies that were there at the time, if you did it, uh, was $787 billion. Uh, even if you could cut that to 10% um, of that number uh, by simplified privacy policies, which I think is sort of way uh, unrealistic, uh, it's still out of proportion to what's at stake. Uh, in the kinds of information that are used and shared uh, uh, in the commercial uh, uh, context. Uh, we need privacy approaches that focus on keeping bad things from happening to consumers rather than a privacy approach that says, here you sift through these pages of fine print and figure out what you want to do. Um, uh, that isn't a realistic way to approach this problem to keep bad things from happening. We need to focus on what consequences we're worried about and think about ways that we can prevent those consequences by either controlling the information that's available or controlling the uses of information uh, that may be available for purposes, so that for, for other purposes. Uh, so that's my three points. This isn't sensitive. This is a question of how much we want um, platform providers to invest in controlling people who use their platforms, um, uh, much like the content issues, and we need to think about consequences rather than notice and choice. Thanks, Howard. Great. Thanks, uh, Howard, uh, for that. I, you know, I'll, maybe I'll start by just uh, agreeing with Howard on, you know, what is the issue here? You know, what was the source of the problem? That it really is a lot more specifically about content uh, than privacy if you're looking at, you know, the, that fact pattern. Uh, the thing, though, that I think probably uh, has changed, I was, I was talking to some, probably some of you up on the Hill and then others around as, as this was all going on the last couple weeks. And, 
there is a heightened awareness, I think, that's happened in the public uh, as to the types of data that are out there, just given all of the press and attention to this. And, and so it reminded me, you know, if you think back, you could, you could say right now that we're in a perfect storm of uh, uh, privacy regulatory developments. If you look at the VAT ballot initiative in California, you look at the GDPR coming into play, uh, you look at what's going on in, in uh, with, with the Facebook and the legislative dialogue. You look at the fact you're about to get an entire new slate of uh, FTC commissioners. You, you've got a bunch of variables that I think create this type of perfect storm. Uh, the 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 good news for those of us who represent um, you know responsible businesses in a, in a lot of these issues is we've seen this before um, numerous times over the last couple of decades and you, you can, whether it was other companies having um, uh, all of the public attention and stage, you know, here in, 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 in the Congress uh, or any of the other uh, variables, uh, enforcement actions and calls for laws, calls for regulation and, and each time um, that storm and, and threat has resulted in different uh, types of responses. For the most part, though, it's been a recognition that this is the, the use of data, uh, the collection of data is just not as simple as transparency and, and choice. I think there's an overlying umbrella there. And um, doesn't lend itself well to uh, kind of a blunt instrument of, of legislation. Uh, I've uh, represented for many years the Direct Marketing Association, now known as the Data and Marketing Association, as well as uh, uh, helped draft and create the self-regulatory framework for the Digital Advertising Alliance. I see my friend Dan Jaffe here, uh, but the ANA, uh, among others, had a, a leading role in, in developing that. And one thing um, that I think is interesting when you try and enumerate what are the problems or challenges we're, we're trying to solve, you then, if you can answer those questions and they're complex and numerous, uh, if you then have to kind of say, well, what's the best solution? What are the best ways to either empower consumers with more choice as happened in the DAA, which was tracking clickstream data and providing choice, or uh, agreeing with Howard's point, um, maybe not set it up so everybody has to read lots of privacy notices, define concrete areas where data restrictions should either be permitted or not allowed at all. In the DAA world, there were a number of examples of clickstream data uh, can't be used for uh, credit worthiness, health care decisions, insurance decisions, similar kind of enumerated practices that uh, they're analogous legal frameworks but have defined certain practices the same way. Um, couldn't even do it with consent, just really restricted the ability to, to do that. Uh, and so when, when you look at types of solutions, uh, you look at a scenario like the DAA where you have 98% of the industry complying, broader than you get for compliance with laws, broader than they're going to see with the GDPR because of market mechanisms. So um, I'll kind of just close with say you've got to, you've got to look when you're thinking about um, once you can enumerate the challenges or areas you, you want to solve, what's the best tools? What are the what are the best tools to to further the dialogue? Well, thanks, Tom. It's uh, nice to be here today. I appreciate the invitation. Um, so I guess my role here is best uh, probably played in the in the role of being a uh, sort of technological historian and thinking about how regulation is played out in different contexts and how it might play out for. Facebook and social media networks going forward in the wake of not just uh, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, but uh, other incidents in recent uh, months and years. And um, I've always loved the quote from my favorite uh, sci-fi show of all time, Battlestar Galactica, that all this has happened before and all this will happen again, which is really from Peter Pan, but Battlestar borrowed it. Um, but the reality is, is that when you think about regulatory history and the history of regulated industries, uh, it repeats. Things tend to repeat. We tend to fall back on uh, old policies or approaches uh, time and time again. And so last week, uh, I wrote a, a little bit of a snarky piece with the title, The Week Facebook Became a Regulated Monopoly and Achieved Its Greatest Victory in the Process. 
Um, so that was kind of a way of grabbing some attention and saying, what? You know, if this political circus going on in Capitol Hill, it's the worst week ever for Facebook. Well, yeah, it probably is in some ways, but it might also be the best because sometimes when you get to a situation like this, you find companies have obtained a certain amount of market power and uh, enough public attention and then political attention that they start falling back on the idea that, well, we'll have to play some ball with Washington um, and go along with certain things. And so one of the most intriguing things about the sort of spectacle we saw on Capitol Hill last week with the hearings was how often that Mr. Zuckerberg was sort of giving in on a number of things that people said he would never give in on. And some of that may have been, you could say, well, there's no choice in the matter. You're going to have to go along with these things. But the reality is, is that at some point, uh, you can see these as being a benefit to Facebook as much as a hindrance. Because at some point, there are only so many firms that can sort of pay the pound of flesh to the regulators when it comes to thinking about things like new types of data restrictions and uh, algorithmic uh, controls or auditing or transparency requirements or GDPR-like things um, or hate speech uh, filtering requirements and sensorial things. In many ways, we have a lot to learn from Europe on this front, but not the ways the Europeans want us to learn it. What we have to learn is that if you actually try to regulate the flow of all data and all of the types of its uses and uh, even misuses, at some point there are only so many firms that are going to be left standing to probably carry out your, your objectives. And so now the Europeans are screaming mad about supposed market power of a handful of American companies when really ought to, we ought to be thinking about is what happened to all the European ones. There's a reason that you don't see the same level of competition in the information technology sector in, in the European continent as you have in the U.S. and across the globe. It's because public policy had something to do with that. And yes, you can regulate to try to achieve greater privacy or security, but there is going to be a cost. There is no such thing as a free, free lunch. And so you have only a handful of firms that are probably now able to comply with things like a right to be forgotten and a lot of these GDPR rules and so on and so forth. And so now we come to the same moment, these crossroads in the United States, where we are faced with the, uh, the consideration of what kind of laws we can pile on Facebook after these latest faux pas, and not thinking through what that means for the future of what we really need, which is more competition and more choice for a diverse citizenry. We do not want to foreclose that pr prospect of having those choices on the thinking that, well, Facebook's the biggest dog in the world right now, and there's no displacing them. Certainly none of us uh, you know, should have thought that 10 years ago when there were actually people who did think that MySpace was never going to be displaced. Some of you remember the early social networking wars and age verification mandate requirements of things that were floating around. It was all about MySpace, MySpace, MySpace. And then poof, they're gone and no longer to consideration. And then a lot of other technology companies have followed the same sort of Schubertarian uh, process over the years, and we've seen these creative waves of destruction come blowing through and displace giants. Now, yes, Facebook's big. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. But the reality is, is that if we impose a whole set of new regulations, onerous ones on that firm, in trying to get our sort of pound of flesh from them from their mistakes and their missteps, it could have collateral damage. It could end up creating a regulatory environment where in converting them to a regulated monopoly, we really get sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy of them being the only game in town, of them being a real monopoly. Because a lot of the new scrappy startups who might want to come in and compete with them on various grounds might not have the same opportunities because they simply can't afford the various costs of regulatory and legal compliance associated with dealing with any new regulatory regime. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to have some standards or have some policies. Certainly we have some pretty good ex post policies in this country in the form of unfair and deceptive practices authority and a host of targeted types of privacy laws uh, for various sensitive types of information. That's a pretty good regime. It's an ex post regime that a lot of people don't like because they want ex post, or I'm sorry, ex ante sort of prophylactic forms of regulation that say thou shall not across the entire data economy. But again, that's the road that the Europeans walk down, and we walk down a different one, and I think it's a better one. And it's a better one that we should be very cautious about adopting the sort of heavy-handed approach, the top-down approach that Europe has taken, lest we are left with fewer and fewer competitors or new innovators that we right now can't envision, but are hopefully right around the corner. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Josephine? Thanks, Tom. One of the things I think is so fascinating about this story, and I was thinking this watching the 
Mark Zuckerberg testimony, and again, listening to my esteemed panelists, is that it's really a story that allows everybody to sort of put their own spin on the question of what is this really about, and what's, what's the important policy question here. And for some people, it's very much about privacy. For some people, it's very much about antitrust and competition. The UK House of Lords just recently came out with a big report about artificial intelligence regulation around Cambridge Analytica, which was wild to me, because it hadn't occurred to me. This was an AI story. So it's it's very much, I think, an incident in which everybody is sort of able to look at it and read into whatever the technology policy issue is that they think is most important or most pressing right now. And I'll give you my bias up front. I'm an academic researcher, and I think about the question of how we assign liability in the aftermath of data security and privacy incidents. So that's what I think is most important and interesting about this incident. And when I sort of sit down and look at what happened in this story, and the question of who I think really behaved badly, who I think there should be sort of punitive action or regulation around, I'll tell you up front, I don't think it was Facebook, right? I look at this story and I say, wow, this professor at Cambridge who said he was doing research and collected all of this data and turned around and gave it to a private firm for other purposes, that to me is the sort of great misdeed in this particular narrative, and again, totally shaped by the fact that I do academic research. I want Facebook to be making data available to academic researchers. I think that's a good thing on the whole, though I certainly would agree that there should be some forms of review in some ways that they perhaps screen that a little more than they do. But in general, I would say sort of the focus on Facebook is very much, I think, about the question of where are the really powerful intermediaries when we're looking at the online space? Who are the actors that regulators can look at and feel like if we make a policy around this, that's going to have a really big impact as opposed to sort of trying to regulate all of the individual academics out there doing whatever it is they do. And there's a lot of logic to that, right? That if you want to make sort of effective policies that have global consequences, even in the context of a national jurisdiction, you want to go after actors like Facebook who have that kind of reach, who have that kind of power. For me, the sort of central questions, and they get back to some of the things that Howard and Stu were talking about in terms of how content is regulated, come back to the ideas about intermediary liability that we have for the internet. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, right, it's very, very profoundly shapes the way that companies like Facebook present themselves and think of their role on the internet. So when Facebook talks about itself as a platform, that's both, I think, you know, an honest representation of what they think they do. They build a, a website or an application that other people can build things on top of and use as a platform for other services, it's also a very powerful legal protection for them because we make this fairly sharp binary distinction between platforms and publishers in the United States. And we say, look, if you're publishing content, that's going to put a whole lot of responsibility on you to think about what's in that content, to be liable for what it says and whether it's accurate. And whatever else, or are you just a platform? Are you just sort of a neutral, paying no attention to what's on there, letting other people post on your website, and therefore not responsible for it? And that's been, I would say, a very powerful tool for good, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. But one of the things it's done is it's really pushed companies like Facebook to that stance of, look, we're totally neutral. We don't want to get involved in thinking about how our platform is used or what kind of content is on there. Because as soon as we start down that road, first of all, it, it's a mess, right? I mean, who wants the job of sort of deciding, you know, is this video something that should be on this website or not, especially at the scale they're operating? But second of all, it introduces a whole lot of new legal complications for us. And so when I look at this story, I come back to this question of how we've created that very sharp binary divide that pushes companies like Facebook to distance themselves from the question of how their platforms are used and what kind of information and content is being posted on them and how it's being shared and who it's being shared with, this stance of sort of supreme neutrality around everything that their tools are used for. And to me, the, the real policy question is, can we make that a more nuanced picture? Can there be sort of a more complicated spectrum between you're just a completely neutral platform with no responsibilities whatsoever 
to you're a publisher, you're completely responsible for everything, you have to read everything that's going up on your site, which is clearly not feasible for a site as large as Facebook, and how we kind of complicate that picture in a meaningful but not overly oppressive, overly intrusive way so that we can get at the responsibilities we think a company like Facebook should perhaps have, even if it's not vetting all of its content pre preemptively, but also allow for the kinds of innovation, for the kinds of user-generated content and services that Section 230 has really helped engender. And one, one sort of side note to that that I think is sort of interesting about this story is it puts a lot of advocates sort of at odds with each other in the online sort of open internet advocacy space because there are a number of groups that are sort of very pro-consumer privacy. And in this story, that's largely about being, you know, Facebook should have more opt-in or more privacy notifications or whatever else. But there are also usually the same groups and people who are very pro Section 230 protections for these platforms in the name of sort of protecting online intermediaries and making sure that innovation can continue on the internet. And so to sort of set those two things at odds with each other, which I think they sort of are in this story, is a, is a very hard kind of policy path to navigate. Doesn't lead to a lot of clear sort of advocacy in the way that there would be around some of the other policy proposals that have come up around this for political advertising or opt-in for privacy consent or things like that. <coughs> Thanks, Josephine. So, um, so let me let me try to take off from some of the things you were saying and circle back to some of the things that uh, that Howard was saying. I mean, from an economist's point of view, when we look at these issues of of regulating private privacy or liability issues, obviously central to the whole thing is is the issue of harm and whether you know, I mean liability doesn't make you know isn't very important if nobody's being harmed or if the harms are, are small. Now, Howard obviously started out by saying, really, as far as he could see, there there really was, uh, if I'm not misrepresenting you, there really was no harm. And I'm not sure I've seen anything in, in the press that uh, that talks about the harm in any in a significant way. But I'm wondering what, what uh, the other panelists uh, feel about that. So I think what makes this story different to me from a number of other sort of online privacy stories that have come up and will continue to come up with some regularity, no doubt, is that a lot of people feel that there was a very severe harm in this case in the form of Donald Trump being elected president. Now, let's set aside for a moment the question of whether or not Cambridge Analytica had anything to do with that and whether or not this data was in any way sort of crucial or made that happen. But so do you think, not, not to interrupt, do you think that's the primary reason why this story has gotten so big? Yes, I don't think this is about people feeling there was individual harm to themselves. Where I would agree with Howard, most people probably don't feel that way directly or certainly no more so than they would in you know another hundred ways in which we've seen companies leak data. But that's the harm that I think has sort of made this into a big thing. Well, I, 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 whoops. I, I agree with that. I think, I think that's exactly what's made it a big thing. But it is, um, um, I, I, I think if you think about it that way at all, you really have to recognize that this was more influential in the Obama election than it was in the Trump election. And there's a whole different set of people who would argue that that was the harm. Yeah, I agree with all this. I uh, do a lot of work on risk analysis in different fields, and I've done some law review articles on risk analysis and benefit cost uh, analysis for digital privacy and online security and safety debates. And it's really, really tricky in these contexts because it's often an uh, eye of the beholder kind of problem. Uh, a lot of these things are extraordinarily subjective. But as Josephine suggested, in this case, what some people are suggesting is that what we're talking about is a form of what is often referred to as existential risk, and in this case, it's political existential risk, uh, uh, that there's some sort of grave threat to democracy, uh, at least in the form of a certain individual who was elected to president uh, of the United States recently. Um, and uh, beyond that, pol politics being too controlled by Facebook or large digital intermediaries. The problem is, is how do you even begin to act accurately measure any of this or create metrics by which we can have rational conversations, especially considering how quickly it gets so political uh, based upon your priors about who you know is qualified to be president or not. Um, and so 
that's just the big picture. And then in the narrow uh, sense, risk is even harder to accurately survey and monitor in the field of privacy and security policy. Um, because individuals will often have contradictory views in their own minds and hearts about the issue. This is the so-called privacy paradox, um, which is that when you look at the willingness to pay literature that economists have put together on how people evaluate privacy, people are very prone to say one thing and then do another. Uh, hence the privacy paradox. And survey after survey suggests that when asked, yes, they, they value their privacy as much as they love mom baseball and apple pie, you know, and it's, it's great, but then they actually do things quite differently in the marketplace when they very freely give away a lot of information, not just on Facebook, but on a lot of other sites. And just on, finally on that point, I'll just point out that this also makes it very hard when you connect that literature and privacy evaluation and risk analysis in this context with questions about what does it mean to actually be adequately informed consumers or provide informed consent in a lot of these contexts, and you start thinking about specifically what are your rational expectations or reasonable expectations of privacy in an environment where sharing is the norm. I mean, I regard Facebook as sort of a digital nudist colony where you're sort of expected to bear your soul every minute of the day there. To me, Facebook is really anti-privacy. Uh, anti it's, it's pro-sharing, and that's fine, and a lot of people love it for that. I personally don't. I don't use it very much. But it's pretty much a digital caveat emptor thing for me when I look at Facebook and say, well, you kind of know what you're getting into. This is a site about sharing. If, if, if Congress wants to pass a law, maybe they can pass a law that has a big banner that goes over Facebook that said, this is an anti-privacy site. Now, you know, Facebook wouldn't like that, but I don't really think people need to know that. They, they already know. You go there to share. That's what you go there for. So one thing I just wanted to highlight when you're talking about harm or, or impact here, you know, uh, a lot of this has... Um, a lot of the fallout of this is focused on the advertising model and using data for advertising. And they were saying, okay, well, maybe it came out of in the political context. And one of the things that strikes me as odd, uh, and I think the notion that the election was swayed one way or the other based on targeting uh, an individual with a true statement, a true advertisement or awareness, I think under uh, estimates or doesn't give enough credit to the American public. That, that's that's one, and I pr think it probably also overestimates the ability to manipulate uh, people based on data. I mean, in the advertising world, the, the goal isn't the use of data to manipulate people, it's to target people in something that they're likely to be interested in. It really is much more about awareness than it is manipulation. And if you think about how that plays in the political context, it would be one thing, and it appears maybe this did happen in, in some context here, but it's one thing if the data is being used to know where you are to tell you that the poll's closing at a time where, in fact, the poll isn't closing, that would somehow limit votes being cast. That's already illegal. Um, very different from identifying uh, people that are likely in a political context to have interests that align with yours. I mean, that's at the heart of our democracy and, and, and the notion that somehow that's a bad thing has always struck me as odd. Let me go back uh, um, a minute to one of the things I think that was brought up quite a, quite a bit in the, con in the congressional hearings and in the various news stories about this, uh, this issue of harm. And, and, uh, and, and this was the issue of transparency. That that uh, it was a bad thing that that most of the 87 million people uh, who were in this database just didn't know, didn't know they were part of the database, didn't know what their data was being used for. And I, I have a feeling that all of us are part of uh, of uh, a lot of marketing databases, and we have no idea that we're part of them. And probably go along fairly happily um, nonetheless. But uh, I mean, is that the case? You're, you work on marketing issues, too. Are, sure. are we all part of marketing databases that we don't know we're part of? Well, I think people are aware, uh, particularly now, certainly more than 10, 20 years ago. But even then, I think people were aware that uh, information about them, primarily demographic information, mostly public record information, is used to find them and target advertising to them. and. I think that's been a widely, uh, while, while widely debated, also widely accepted practice in just about every uh, governmental body that's considered it. Uh, the FTC, and Howard certainly could speak to this, has uh, you know, long championed advertising, marketing, and, and all of the 
the, the benefits that come there. I think one thing that came up in the Facebook um, scenario that I know there was some, some concern among the marketing community is somehow it was painting that very issue as if somehow this, that per, this concern or problem with Cambridge Analytica somehow was caused or could be solved by limiting the use of access to um, you know, uh, data providers, which, which uh, really isn't, isn't the case. The, the one other comment that I'll make is I think there is a difference, and I think it actually goes to the comment Josephine was making, which is there's a difference between demographic data, uh, you know, who you are, where you live, maybe even who your friend is, I guess that would go one side or the other, between that and I think um, content or user-generated content. And that may be a place where there, there needs to be kind of more dialogue thought about, but, but using just identification data and demographic data to better target people uh, seems to me that that, that debate has, has been solved, even though I'm sure we'll be having it again. <laughs> but why is that? Why, I think Howard wants to say something with me. Why is that different than, why is it different knowing whatever my objective demographic information rather than, you know, which movies I like? Well, I think it's where you draw the balance between um, uh, policy-based interests, and I think the, the 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 balance has clearly been drawn that it it's better to further promote uh, small businesses being able to reach customers and all that benefits from there, uh, in contrast to you know otherwise publicly available data being available, and where the policy, as you know, is netted out there, is consumers still actually have a choice with respect to that data. It's just where the, the default is. I think, I don't know if the answer is actually any different, um, but I think the debate hasn't been had about, you know, the content. It's been had in the liability context, but it hasn't been had about where the balance of policy interests are between using that type of data derived for, for advertising or other purposes. I think this is also an area where we've seen Facebook sort of in the crosshairs before. I'm thinking particularly of Julia Anglin at ProPublica who wrote a lot of pieces even before the Cambridge Analytica story happened about the different choices you can make if you're buying ads on Facebook for who you want to target, right? And so the ways that somebody like me who's not in the advertising world might think of that demographic targeting as, you know, oh, she's a woman in this age bracket, maybe show her shoes, when in fact it's actually much, much more nuanced than that as, you know, neo-Nazi based on extrapolating statements that have been made and comments or photos and so I think there is some sense that somewhere along the way from you know age and gender and location to here are all of the things that you're prejudiced about that you don't even know you're prejudiced about or or that you never selected right there's there's something that starts to make people more uncomfortable about that targeting but I don't know yeah, where and I is. think to me you know I think it's it where the dialogue would would come would be where how those how that data was derived right if the data was derived from traditional demographic or transactional data um, again I not that the debate won't happen again but I think the public policy line has been shown and proven time and again the economic value to all consumers on that balance when you start talking about doing derivations not from transaction or just self input data but content, stuff that's more content, and maybe figuring out where that line is, and I agree it's a continuum, that may be where it gets, you know, more um, interesting. And just one more point to take it to an extreme in the pre-internet world, you know, you saw the debate there in content of a communication, you know, in, in telecommunication, uh, has a different standard. You know, at one point where you're hearing in on somebody's voice conversation, well, that, that is subject to a heightened standard and, and more of a surveillance type of, of, of opt-in or consent. Um, and, and the question is, well, this is neither fish nor fowl. It's, it's not quite that, although some of it could be that type of content, but it's also not quite, you know, just traditional public record demographic data. Yeah, that's, I, was, I was wondering, I mean, because the information at issue here is who are your friends? Who's, who's your friends list? Is that content or? Or not? I, I I would probably put the friends list on the non-content side, um, but but there are other things that people put on um, uh, any number of whether it's Facebook or any other social media platform or just general publishers that I think go beyond that type of thing. 
Well, speaking of advertising, one of the one of Facebook's responses to this uh, whole episode is to say they're stopping their program uh, where they uh, combined their data with data from data brokers to better, to presumably, to better target uh, their members in terms of uh, in terms of advertising to deliver better targeted advertising. Is that something that is? Uh, Helpful to consumers. Or? See, I think I, I'll weigh in there. At the, you know, the DMA is as is a lot of their key members and board members that the those the data providers and also known as data brokers. I think I, I, I prefer provider than, than broker somehow or other. But um, you know, it, it's interesting to me because when you when you look in a world now of this level of sophistication and scale, the the quote unquote data providers or data brokers in the way that they're talked about in that context. Are really the most reputable companies that are engaged in this business, and that's where you would actually want those to be the companies that are providing the data. And so I don't, I, I actually think limiting uh, use of those types of companies actually probably hurts consumer protections and also probably limits the the value that we just talked about in in uh, in, in marketing and otherwise. They may have had, you know, obviously it's a different business model and difference to say this, but I noticed in the press comments tied to that, they were, they, they were also clear to say things like, um, we recognize it's a widely accepted practice and weren't actually saying it was a bad practice. They were just saying they weren't going to do it uh, on their site given the layers of additional scrutiny um, of, you know, diligence that would have to happen downstream. But there is kind of a theme that runs through the privacy, you know, even way before this particular episode that somehow combining two sets of data uh, is a bad thing. Yeah, there's certainly that theme. I, I, you know, I, I, m all of my clients disagree with that. I, I, as somebody who's lived this personally, has seen all the good that comes out of these products and services and things, and even as a consumer, um, I, I, I think it's a, a, a valuable thing to society. And I think you know, you, you do have a true model of where that is happening yeah. less in Europe and, and all of the good things that happen that they're not seeing. Let me shift to something else. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to, to, to add a thought on the, on the combining data. I mean, the one, the one thing, that, the only thing that's unique about combining data sets, I think, is that inevitably in combining data sets, you will have mismatches. Uh, you'll make mistakes in in matching up yeah. one person's data uh, or one person's. You're matching up my online data with your real world data, uh, and those kinds of mistakes are uh, they're reducible, but they're unavoidable. Uh, and that's the only thing that's sort of unique yeah. about combinations. Um, I mean, otherwise, it's. It, um, I, I mean, I, I too, as an academic researcher, more data is always good. <laughs> Let me uh, shift to the, a little bit. Um, as I indicated, there was a big uh, drop in the price of, uh, of Facebook's and, and Facebook stock price, as well as other other tech companies' stock prices. How do you all interpret that? What is that? What what is that? What's the meaning of that? So I would probably be inclined to say it's really too soon to say what the economic consequences of this are going to be Not the consequences, the, the causes. How oh, you, the causes. What, what was the market, what was the market? Um, See, that's saying. where the term broker is the right term. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let me put it this way. There's two, there's, there's, uh, there's two obvious interpretations of this. One is that Facebook is doing something that their customer, that their, their members, their customers don't like. And, and that was, and the market was, uh, uh, responding to that, which would be a good thing, would give them an incentive to do things their customers like. The other, the other interpretation, which uh, is that, it, it would, especially since other other tech companies' stocks were also involved, is that this was just a was a generalized fear of more regulation. And there may be there may be other interpretations too, but those are the two obvious ones. I think it's probably some of both that you've got both the sort of short short term concern people are going to shut down their Facebook accounts, they're not going to have as many customers, they're going to make less revenue, as well as the sense of Congress might get interested and make it harder for them to sell certain types of ads and drive down their business that way. I do just want to note from the literature on stock prices of companies that experience data breaches, which this was not exactly, there's a, there's a fairly good body of literature that shows that there's about a week of decline, right? Like Target gets breached and their stock 
goes down for about five, six, seven days, and then it rebounds pretty quickly. So that's why I say, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't read too much into it right off the bat because it was a very volatile moment. Of course, if we were to, if we were to agree with Adam, which I normally do, then the stock price should have gone up because of the general generalized fear of regulation. Because it's going up on the day of the hearing. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, if they're going to become a. a a protected, regulated monopoly, the stock price should have gone, gone up, right? Well, it's still too early to know if yeah. that actually happens. And right. I don't think most no, of I, are factoring that one in yet and thinking about cheap, how yeah. that plays yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's... Let's talk a little bit about some of the remedies that have been proposed. We talked about one remedy, this, the Facebook remedy, which is, which is, could be part of legislation too in terms of not combining databases. But then there are other, there are, you know, the the the, the uh, uh, Tim Cook had uh, this proposal, which is part of a lot of privacy proposals, uh, that base that that. Um, uh, Use, you know, we should have regulations that prevent users' data from being used in any new ways without their knowledge. So I, I, I have to pile in there. I mean, I, I have one of their devices, and and uh, I got to say, what well, you know, I know why I use the devices. All of the um, low cost or no cost content, which is fueled by the ad supported uh, model, so. The, the notion that you know that is why they sell their devices ultimately they may you know have a a, a margin compared to some other device but ultimately um, the devices are all pretty similar and they're all used for the same thing and that's what's fueling their exact product so when he says I wouldn't have been in that business well he is in that business well I think there's also I mean a, a very obvious but important note to make about the fact that that's very easy for Tim Cook to say from over on his perch in Apple where they make their money by selling devices, not by selling advertisements. And so it's obviously his go-to remedy is that, you know, this regulation that would completely cripple all of my competitors would be a great one for my company. That's not to say there's not necessarily some value in the kinds of solutions that he's proposing, but I think each tech company looks at this very much from the perspective of what is our business model and what is the regulation that would make that the strongest, most secure, most successful business model. So let me get it back to something that somebody mentioned earlier, is this, and this came up quite a bit in the congressional hearings. Is, is this whole thing, and is this a, is this an argument against the uh, the advertising supported model? And, and uh, is it is it even feasible to talk about uh, a model that's for this type of business that's not advertising supported? I, I mean, conceptually, yeah, yeah it's know, possible. Yeah. Uh, uh, it is, uh, but I mean, the advertiser supported model. Um, is a very good one for providing what are essentially public goods. Uh, the clearest example that we've lived with for many years is broadcast television or FM radio, for those of you who actually remember an era when you could get content for free over the air, but you had to put up with ads. Uh, and that's, it was, that was what made the content possible. And that is very much the model, the, the internet model. Even in the print media, uh, the, the model was always shared, um, part subscription revenue, mostly advertising revenue, um, uh, that, was, that supported all print media. This is why newspapers are in trouble. That's right. um, uh, is uh, is the, that, that model is the, the, the best way we've found to provide public good kinds of content that, that, that doesn't get uh, used up. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's also television programs that don't have advertising where you pay. Um, that was HBO's idea uh, when, when it first, first started, and it's certainly what's behind Netflix and a whole bunch of other sources. That is in sometimes and in some places a viable model. Um, and you see in Spotify you can get a advertising supported version or you can pay and not have ads. Um, I, I think um, this is a market where we're likely to see experimentation uh, in different approaches and different uh, different mixes. 
between advertising revenue and subscription uh, uh, kinds of, uh, of revenue, uh, where uh, uh, we really need that market experimentation and to try to say we're going to disadvantage or advantage one business model over another uh, is a really bad idea because we just don't know which one we ought to favor. Yeah, I'll agree with all that. Just maybe add three three points. Uh, one, I think uh, advertising in that public good description has always been a key and important model, and I think that's indisputable and will continue. Advertising is, is a good thing. It's as American as, as apple pie uh, and all of the innovation that's come along with it, First Amendment benefits and other things as well. Uh, two, uh, consumers like and businesses like uh, targeted advertising better than spam or non-targeted advertising. I think that's unquestionable. And three, target advertising is best able to be delivered with consumer data done responsibly. So if you follow those three things, I think it's hard to get to a conclusion, even though in some frameworks or instances, you know, you'll, you'll get, uh, you know, maybe HBOs or different options, but it's hard to come to a conclusion that you don't wind up with a system. You may have to define what responsible use of data is a little more clearly, but that is uh, targeted advertising based on responsible use of data. I'll just say one thing in addition to everything that's been said, which I agree with, which is that, that when you look at the, the academic literature about these issues, you'll often find a number of uh, critics of not just Facebook, but the data-driven economies who often say something along the lines that if you're not paying, then you're the product, and that only by having a paid offering will, can we get more privacy protections. I think that's really interesting from a couple of perspectives. Number one, um, most of the history of regulatory economics, law and economics, has been focused on bringing prices down. And from a consumer welfare perspective, it would be quite a bizarre world we'd be entering if we were suggesting that consumers would be better by paying more. So there's an irony to that that I hope is appreciated by people, because most of these services, being non-priced to consumers, are considered to be a great benefit from the perspective of traditional law and economics. Second of all, uh, the assumption that by paying, there's no longer sort of a privacy protection, I think that's a flawed assumption. I think there's still going to be other types of information collected in other ways. Um, and then third, because of the point I made earlier about consumers' willingness to pay or lack thereof, I think there's going to be a strong incentive for a lot of companies, even if they're encouraged or forced to go to a pay model, to offer people up an alternative which is not priced. And people will be very easily pushed or incentivized to move right back towards that. So if they, model. if the if Facebook or Google, if, if they offered a, a, a paid option. Premium, with, premium option. A premium paid, paid option, option. Where they yeah. didn't collect data. Would that be a good way to take the political pressure off? It, it might be, but the question is, how many people are going to take it in a world where, you know, the willingness to pay literature suggests that people aren't willing to even spend like a couple of pennies to protect their privacy in a lot of cases. But it, it is interesting to me that somebody doesn't try to run that test, that we don't see more experimenting with this. I think one of the easiest ways for Facebook to debunk this for the academics or other supporters of such a thing is just to offer it up and say, who wants to pay nine ninety five a month for the service? I don't think you're going to get many takers. I do think there are potentially new political problems you introduce that way, right? If you look at the literature on sort of who values privacy and how privacy is distributed among the population, that I think also potentially invites criticisms around, so you're saying that richer people get more privacy and you've sort of created privacy as a premium good as opposed to uh, a basic right for everybody who's using your service. So I don't know if it takes all the political pressure off, but I agree it would be interesting. I would be curious to see what happened and how many people actually took them up on that offer. Yep. I, I'm, I'm with Adam. I don't think it would be very many takers, but and, and, and I agree with you there may be a, a different political problem, but I think it's ironic that that there actually seem to be congressmen interested in saying, well, everybody should have to pay because we wouldn't want some people to be, as, as you suggest, some people to be able to get privacy uh, that, that, that others can't afford to pay for. Let me, uh, I have some other questions, but let me open it up to the, uh, to the audience. And, uh, anyway, I, and we should uh, wait for the microphone. I think we have, do we have somebody? Uh, Carl Zabo with NetChoice, and I know this thing isn't on yet, but I'll just keep talking anyways. Uh, 
Josephine, I, I think you brought up an important point about what was the harm because this wasn't a new story. A new story. The Cambridge Analytica story is actually broken by the Guardian back in 2015 when it was used by Senator Cruz's campaign. So the only real change between then and now was that Donald Trump actually used Cambridge Analytica as well. But uh, one of the things that, that's been talked about a lot is the harm to interest-based advertising. We talked about GDPR, the opt-in regime. There's some bills on the Hill suggesting we go into an opt-in regime. We updated our numbers, found it would cost $340 billion over the next five years to American businesses if we switch to an opt-in regime for interest-based ads. You, you've kind of talked about some of the actual harms. What are, what are the actual things that the end users will see if we strip all that money out of the economy and out of websites and platforms? I, I think it's really hard to know where um, uh, where it would come from. I mean, because the question the question is, if publishers have less money, uh, which content are they most going to cut back on? Uh, and I don't I don't know the answer to that. Uh, they will cut back um, uh, probably more on content that attracts fewer people. Uh, the you know the the niche kinds of contact content product would seem to me to be more at risk because they cost something to produce and they don't they don't bring in as many people and bringing in more and more eyeballs becomes more important if you can't differentiate um, uh, for 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 people uh, I, I think it would be a very bad experiment to run. Um, uh, but uh, I, I mean that it, it does seem like it would you know the, the the safest stuff is the mass market stuff that everybody wants to see uh, the 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 stuff that is your unique interests is what's most at risk. It, the one thing I'll add, I agree completely w w with Howard, which is, and that choice already exists in a very simple way for consumers who uh, want to exercise that choice in the tool of the Digital Advertising Alliance, and it really is unbelievably simple. You can press one button and be out of the, the entire infrastructure, and because there is some percentage of the population that really cares about that and doesn't want the value exchange, but it isn't the majority. Stu, how I many people is it? Well, I, I can tell you the factual number, there are about 20 million uh, consumers have exercised choice. You know, the, the follow-up question for an economist would be, you know, at what at what point do you does the model break? Right? How many how many opt-outs? I think it's way way more in a global economy than than 20 million. But the public knows about this program. They they see the icon. They they, they 20 20 million have done it. I think in terms of what it would look like, my best guess would be a lot more of those buttons. Right, that every time you go to a website, you're getting more of those little pop-up notices that you've probably seen if you've traveled in Europe and you've gotten, you know, cookie <coughs> notifications, a lot more of the sort of, is it okay if we collect this? Is it okay if we collect this? Is it okay if we collect this? My guess would be that we'll treat those roughly the way we already treat the sorts of click-through agreements that we have. I would say just going back to your point about harm, right, this is a very unique incident in a certain sense that what we're talking about when we talk about harm, I think, is, is the result of an election. But it's also true that for all sense, sort of incidents around data security and privacy, the question of how we quantify and understand harm has been a very hard one, right? That any sort of incident where we can't point to a direct example of somebody using your credit card or causing you direct financial harm, it's been very difficult in, say, class action lawsuits and other types of attempts to remedy these to say, well, you know, what exactly was the harm to you when your medical records were stolen or your account on Ashley Madison was revealed? How do we sort of understand that harm and treat it in the policy and legal realm? That's not a new issue. That's something that we've been wrestling with for years and have certainly not sort of resolved, even in incidents where the harm is less unique and extreme than it might be here. Uh, John Doe from the Jill Smith Law Firm. Uh, <coughs> I have a, a comment uh, and a, uh, about uh, advertising and then a question about regulation. 
on advertising, I'm not sure you should assume that people really understand the model. Listening to the hearings last week, it struck me that maybe a lot of people understood, but that the members of Congress asking the question certainly didn't. They kept asking, uh, you know, to, to whom does Facebook sell the information about their uh, members and users and so on uh, in order to derive the advertising benefit. And uh, they didn't really seem to understand how the advertising and how the targeted ads actually come into the uh, uh, feeds of the, of the users. So I wouldn't assume that the, the model itself is understood and therefore that the value can, can be appreciated. Uh, my question on regulation, you, you mentioned about how uh, uh, heavier regulation might uh, uh, be a benefit to uh, larger companies that can pay for it. Um, what about the, uh, so, so you were addressing the competitive effects of regulation. What about the marketplace for regulation itself? As between the U.S. model, let's say, the light hand of regulation under Section 230 and just uh, with uh, t uh, sectoral regulation with FTC backup versus the GDPR. Uh, listening to the hearings, it certainly seems like GDPR is, is prevailing, perhaps, in that regulatory uh, marketplace. Uh, that could have impacts. And what's the answer to that? Just trying to say, no, it's worked out really well for the United States so far? Or perhaps to come up with a new model that can be more competitive in the world uh, with GDPR so that a you know, more rational outcome uh, obtains in the end? Well, I think there's pretty clearly a, a stark conflict divisions about the right approach to regulating the digital economy that we've seen uh, over the last 20 years and a sort of transatlantic uh, clash of visions. <clears throat> I'd like to think that there's a lot to be said for the fact that the model that the Clinton administration adopted in the mid-90s pursuant to the framework for global electronic commerce and that Congress generally signed off on through a series of actions is is pretty good one for American competitiveness. And a lot of European innovators and a lot of investors flock to America's shores to take advantage of that model. Now, there is, of course, the corresponding cost of that model that we've been talking about here today and more generally for a long time, which is that, yes, indeed, there was a lot more information sharing. There was, a, there was a, uh, some costs in terms of what it meant for one's privacy. But there were a whole heck of a lot of benefits. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens if Facebook starts to essentially uh, sort of adopt a stance of saying, well, we'll enforce the European policies in an extraterritorial sense and push them over here to the states. Now, will others fall in line or will everybody just stick with Facebook and go ahead and uh, move forward in that model? I don't know. Uh, generally speaking, we live in a world of global innovation arbitrage and people can shop around to find the jurisdictions most hospitable uh, to various types of digital commerce and speech. But sometimes it does have its limits, and it'll be an interesting moment to see what will happen if Facebook does, as Zuckerberg suggested and during uh, comments during last week and, and after the hearing, that they were going to go ahead and push it forward uh, and adopt it more broadly. Yeah, that was going to be my question. Is, is, is what we do here becoming less and less relevant and being overtaken by, for example, what the Europeans do? I mean, no. with these global companies, <laughs> these global companies saying, and yeah, yeah, I'm sure Facebook's not alone saying, well. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think that the, uh, the companies will find, new companies will surface, other existing companies that don't follow that model will be more successful because um, the, 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 the proof is in how these companies have gotten this successful to begin with. And it isn't following a model of restriction of data and and, and uh, limitation and regulation. So that would suggest that competitive f factors will will uh, force uh, Zuckerberg to go back on what he said. I, I don't know. I don't know what they what I, what I they'll mean, do or their interest yeah. on it. But but uh, but it it would to me suggest that uh, the use of data and the sharing of data will continue to. Um, uh, be the fuel that that's driving uh, the the great um, ad supported model that that exists. Um, Roger Cochetti, and first let me say I've had the pleasure to work with many of the panelists on this issue over the years, and it's nice to see you all. And thank you for the work you've done in this. And I, I want to raise a question of what I think is the 800-pound gorilla sitting in the corner of the room sometimes discussed in the United States, frequently discussed in, in Europe, 
and that is the potential that with the accumulation of data and enormous databases on, on consumers, that the day will come when the government confiscates this and then what you're facing is a completely different type of issue and not, is, not a competitive issue or providing the best lamb chops for people who like this, that, the other thing, but rather how governments will use the data if they, if they confiscate it or if they acquire it. Um, and it's openly discussed in Europe that this is what we worry about and some segments of the American political community talk about it. But since uh, the revelations of uh, Snowden a few years ago, the issue has come much more to the fore in the United States. So I'd like the panel to discuss a little bit because when you scratch this further and sort of what are you worried about, what are you worried about, what's the issue, what's the issue, you know, a, a, a large percentage of the time in Europe it's government and a growing percentage of the time in the United States it's government. So um, are there any thoughts on how this intersects with George Orwell's future? Would, well, it, would it be legal? Would it be a taking? <laughs> Would it be a taking? <laughs> I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but it's a, it's a valuable asset. What? This is what's underneath the surface. Well, the sharing of information between corporations and government has always caused for profound concern, if uh, especially done under duress or stress of some sort. And clearly, this has been a problem in the past, and it's been a very serious problem where we've seen regulated monopolies in, uh, put, put in place by law or in, incentivized by law because then the sharing is a very free-floating kind of thing. It's frictionless and, uh, you know, basically at that point companies are nothing more than the servants of the state. Um, what we want is a competitive environment where we have a lot of different players, some of which are pushing the envelope very aggressively. We've seen this uh, in the encryption wars with the question of unlocking smartphones, right? There have been a number of different players. Thank God there wasn't just one. Right? And it wasn't a regulated monopoly. We have a number of different players who push back aggressively and say, no, there's a process. You need to follow that process. Right? And I'll just make this note as well, that the Europeans are just as guilty of Americans of allowing the state to you know, get too much surveillance of private companies and pushing against their own privacy policies in this regard. The one thing I, I'd add there, I think it's a, a astute observation, Roger, and nice to see you too. Uh, the, the one thing I would add is um, that... Uh, it just goes to solution, you know. It, it, you know, identifying the problem. What's the solution? Which is, you figure out what the right limitations are on government. Yeah, no, I, I agree with with Stu completely on that. I mean, it, this this is why it's important to identify the consequences that we care about, uh, because if that's the consequence, the solution is make it harder for government to get information from private companies. Um, and that makes a lot more sense than trying to pretend the information doesn't exist. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on, sorry, Jesse Blumenthal from the Charles Koch Institute. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the point that Professor Wolf made about the tension in some, especially civil society groups, between those who traditionally favor sort of strong Section 230 protections and those who uh, also favor, you know, new or greater privacy regulations of some sort. Um, beyond this current flare-up, um, I'm wondering, does that tension sort of resolve itself and they sort of go back to doing their, their usual thing, or do you think that that, that tension continues to, to exacerbate? So where do we go from here? I don't know the answer, but I think there are a lot of ways in which that tension shows up, not just in this story, but when we talk about data security and privacy issues more broadly, because a lot of the ways we've thought about Section 230 and intermediary liability have really been around free speech and First Amendment protections. And that's where a lot of civil society groups have come in and said this is, you know, a really important civil liberties issue. And I think we're gaining a clearer understanding of the fact that those intermediary liability protections are actually about much more than free speech and that you can think it's good for there to be those First Amendment protections in place for certain kinds of websites and applications, but also perhaps be concerned about what their ramifications are for security and privacy in other instances. And I think that's an area where there's a lot of tension 
between people and themselves, right? Between those the people in those groups who work on consumer privacy and the people in those groups who work on free speech and First Amendment issues. And I don't think that goes away. I think that gets worse. And I think it exacerbates with this focus on regulating intermediaries that we're seeing right now with Facebook. That when you're the US government, or really when you're any national government, and you think about regulating the internet in, in almost any way, for almost any purpose, you're going to come back to the same sets of companies. You're going to come back to the online service providers, the internet service providers, the big, powerful, centralized intermediaries, where you think, I can have an international impact by regulating these guys. I can have a large, fast impact by regulating them. And all of them are going to be dealing with a whole nest of different issues, of which free speech is only going to be one. And they're going to keep coming back to this issue of, how do we do this in a way that preserves what's been great about intermediary liability protections under Section 230, but also recognizes that these aren't completely neutral platforms, that they do have some responsibility in some of these ways that we want to be able to carve out and put into policy. So uh, it's, uh, let me just, uh, it seems to me that uh, to have a more no nuanced approach like you were talking about to begin with uh, really involves some sort of limitations on the on the uh, on the li on the liability safe harbors um, is that is that the direction to go yeah I think that's right I think it means carving out sort of the places in which that liability protection is not going to be as absolute as it is in section 230 uh, I'll just say and uh, building on that in response to Jesse's question that the way we see this tension playing out in a very interesting way is we're starting to witness a lot of academic talk about the idea of information fiduciaries uh, as well as the idea of algorithmic accountability or algorithmic auditing. And these efforts, which would presumably create some sort of special duty of care when it came to data handling and data responsibilities, also open, open up an interesting set of uh, sort of a can of worms about like what does it really mean to have that duty of care and who's doing the auditing or what kind of information will be uh, uh, overseen or uh, is made to be more accountable through this auditing. But what does fiduciaryism mean when it comes to, on one hand, on privacy, which people would say, well, we would want a greater duty of care and corresponding legal responsibilities and or liability. Um, but what would it mean when it comes to something like, you know, controversial forms of speech? And does a greater duty of care mean more essentially censorship of some sort? Um, I don't. I don't think people have thought through this all, but it's certainly it, it's one of these new, uh, sexy-sounding ideas. You know, who could be against algorithmic accountability and information fiduciaryism, right? But when you start to unpack these concepts, there's a lot of thorny problems inside. But this is clearly where the academic community, the privacy advocates, are heading on this front, and I think that's where we're going to see more regulatory proposals framed around. I would say just about the information fiduciaries proposal, I know Jonathan Zittrain just had a big op-ed in the New York Times about this idea, and I think Adam's exactly right that it's an idea that comes from the financial world, right, where the idea of fiduciaries is you have to do the thing that makes your, your customer the most money, where there's a very clear-cut idea of what's good for you and what's bad for you. Making more money is good, making less money is bad. And part of the problem with trying to translate those ideas into the online world is that each of you probably has a very different idea, even just in this room, about what would be a good Facebook for you, what would be a good privacy setting for you. And so this idea that Facebook is going to be able to say, you know, I'm going to act in the best interests of all of you at once is, I think, actually a very complicated and hard one to bring in from other policy realms. I, I just wanted to underline, I think the tension that you asked about is inherent, uh, and it's inherent in part for resource um, reasons, because it really is, uh, um, you know, from in, in asking companies to do more to police how apps are using data, which is the, the essence of the Cambridge Analytica problem, versus asking companies to do more to police content, to take more liability for content, however we structure that and with whatever exceptions, there's a trade-off there. Uh, the more they spend worrying about content, the less that's available to spend worrying about privacy and vice versa. I mean, where are we going to spend the resources? Uh, that question guarantees a tension between the, the worry about the content and the worry about the data.
Uh, hello, Andrew Steele, uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, International Trade Administration. Uh, thank you so much for this excellent. Is this on? Yeah. Thank you so much for this excellent talk. Uh, I spend most of my day looking at GDPR, so uh, thinking about uh, promoting U.S. competitiveness in the global economy. I think my my concern, or one of the questions we look at, is the World Wide Web and a regulatory patchwork. Uh, and Stu mentioned the uh, California ballot initiative. Uh, do you think that U.S. companies would be more receptive towards a federalized approach where there's sort of experimentation throughout the states? Some of the attorneys general are looking at this Facebook issue. So obviously different states have different uh, maybe uh, attitudes of, of, or dispositions. Or do you think that there's more of a need for a, a one-size federal approach, and we might be looking at that? Well, I think the ideal approach would be no more laws. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, because and I, I think the reputable and responsible companies have, have self-regulated and, and can and will uh, continue to evolve. Uh, I think uh, there certainly would be a preference for a, a federal standard if, if uh, and I think because by definition one of the states uh, inevitably will get it wrong. Um, meaning require too much consent or too too much restriction and you know if you're if that is going to be needed and you start that starts being a driver for passage of legislation just like it was when the can spam act was enacted to you know uh, get a federal standard to preempt a bad state law uh, I think a broad framework that allowed for the self-regulation like the digital advertising alliance or otherwise uh, in some sort of safe harbor or permitted way would also give people like you uh, a great opportunity abroad to argue for frameworks of, you know, that defer to self-regulatory standards. I've always thought the notion of um, let's let's pick our favorite law or the marketplace of regulation, let's, let's pick the favorite law and then go sell it to every country around the world to try and get them to enact more laws. Give me one. I, I thought that's a horrible idea, and, and 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 the main reason is there's no example of that model in any area. Uh, you know, all you're going to wind up with is more bad laws and everybody with some other of, of their own characterization. So if you're going to try and create a global framework, you have to have one that can defer to a self-regulatory uh, type of standard. And of course, they're not going to defer. Regul regulators won't defer to that type of standard unless it's effective and strong and reputable. I think we have time for one more, if if there is one more. Tom, I apologize. i got to bounce out to do a Wall Street okay. Journal chat right. with Ryan Kahlo about algorithmic accountability. Good. Hi, my name uh, is Enrique Gonzalez. I'm, sure I'm digital win. analytics at the <laughs> Journal Science. Uh, I've been doing digital analytics for about 15 years. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Enrique Gonzalez. Uh, run digital analytics at the Journal of Science. I've been doing digital analytics for about 15 years. It seemed like the whole discussion over the last weeks really focused on just Facebook and just Zuckerberg. And many, many, many of the players in the digital space do exactly the same thing, with the exception of the app that allowed a third party to take Facebook data, um, um, accumulate it, and then improperly share with the third party. Um, so I was hoping you could discuss a little bit about that and also non-internet related data collection. Um, everything from your smart trip card, your loyalty card, your credit cards, um, all those kinds of things which nobody seems to be talking about. Um, I've, I've, I've actually always thought it was um, odd that we worried so much about online tracking and so little about offline tracking because it's the extent you care it's the it's the exact same thing uh, in in terms of its uh, in terms of its privacy implications uh, I think um, there's there's uh, there are just enormous benefits that come from that information sharing uh, I mean that that's um, the 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 fraud control tools that that mean your credit card company finds out about a fraudulent transaction before you do um, depend on um, depend on information they depend on a lot of information that comes from a lot of different places that doesn't necessarily that wasn't why it was collected 
Um, uh, and uh, uh, whether that happens online or offline seems to me to be inconsequential. That's why I'm not worried about merging those data sets as, as something that, re that raises uh, any, any particular issues other than the matching problems. Uh, but those things, they, clearly there's other people doing exactly the same stuff. Um, uh, and you know, to the to the extent they can, and if uh, you know, the thing that's unique about Facebook and Facebook's data is your friends, uh, and the uh, you know, there's a interesting competition between Facebook and Google as to how important is that in the value of online advertising versus all the other pieces of information that can be used. Well, one thing I'll just build on the enormous benefits that I think you see from all of that data. Um, are I think you've seen the them in, uh, heighten in, in value and the, in, the opportunity to create great benefits, whether it's in education and health care, uh, treatments, uh, all, all kinds of things. And I think we're really still just at the very beginning of, of all of that. So all I would say to add is that when you say there are lots of companies that do exactly the same thing as Facebook, I think you're absolutely right in the context of collecting your data and sometimes sharing it or using it to target ads. I think that what's different here is that there's really nobody like Facebook in terms of individuals' day-to-day -day interactions with the website. And that part of what has led to so much focus on Facebook in this story has been around sort of the role it plays in people's lives as opposed to what actually it's doing with their data as compared to other companies. Let me please join me in thanking the panelists. It was a great discussion.